Chapter 16, A Swooner in Sneakers Some kids, when no playmates were around, didn't know what to do. I didn't have this problem. There was always exploring, and exploring was best done alone. The red hills, the spear field, the tracks, the path, the dumps, all were sectors to be investigated time and again. But usually, my route of exploration followed Norristown's signature waterway, Stony Creek. My territory ranged from two grassy blanket-sized islands near the Elm Street Bridge to the far end of Elmwood Park, where the creek forked, one branch turning west into the vast farmlands of the state hospital, the other meandering north, on toward East Norton Township. In some places, the going was easy, such as the stony flats under the Sturger Bridge, Street Bridge. In others, the banks were so steep and near the water that I had to pull myself along with roots for handholds or hop the rocks midstream. The total length was a mile or more, to me it seemed Mississippian, and not an inch along the way, on either side, was unknown to the rubber soles of my black and white high-top keds. The zoo toward the far end of the park was, and still is, one of Norristown's treasures, and I visited often. But it was near the western edge of the zoo, along the creek, where I came to know creatures unpenned. Squatting over the shallows, I studied schools of minnows in the finger-deep water. I pulled up a rock, and more often than not a crayfish. We called the tiny lobster lookalikes crawfish. Scooted briefly into the sunlight, and then under another rock. Water spiders skated over the glaring surface, while angel-winged dragonflies and neon-blue darning needles shimmered above. Lurking below was something nasty. Leeches. Bloodsuckers. They were everywhere, but unseen and unfelt. The only way to observe them was to leave a hand or foot in the water too long. That's what I did once. It was one of the few times I found myself with others at the creek. I was waiting, I don't remember why, with my shoes and socks off and my dungarees rolled up, and when I got out, one of the other kids screeched and pointed. I looked down and saw them, black, worm-like bloodsuckers clinging to the white snow skin of my shins. Frantically, I scraped them off. Now I was staring at a half a dozen driblets of blood where the vampires had been dining. Were leeches poisonous? I didn't know but rattlesnakes were, and I knew from my cowboy days how to handle a snake bite. I sat on the bank, hoisted a bare leg in the air, and announced, Okay, you guys, you gotta get the poison out. Start sucking. Suddenly, everyone remembered they had to be somewhere else that instant. As they clambered up the banks, I wiped off the blood with my shirt, picked up my socks and sneaks, and walked home as delicately as I could, afraid that if I came down too hard on my bloodless legs, they might crumple. I took a bath and survived the night. And there were frogs, heard, but almost never seen. Try as I might, I was never silent enough to sneak up on them. I knew them only by the watery plops that preceded me as I walked along the creek bank. There were snakes, mostly the common garter, but occasionally I chanced upon a truly special snake. Once, down near the Elm Street Bridge, I found a large black one sunning on a flat rock. I pinned it behind the head with my stick, picked it up, and took it home. I put it in a two-handled tin picnic box and covered it with perforated cardboard. The next morning, the snake was gone. I looked under everything in the house, but couldn't find it. Nor could I understand why my mother was so upset. She must have blabbed to the neighbors, because for the next several days, panic held the 800 block in its grip. We never found it. On another day, I looked into the creek and saw a small brown and yellow water snake. It was like a jewel set among the sun diamonds sparkling in the water. It was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen, and at first I didn't believe it. When I did, it was gone with the current. I raced downstream, concentrating on shallow shadow patches, for only there was it visible. I caught sight of it for one, caught sight of it once for a moment, then lost it for good. I kept running the bank, searching, searching. The next day I returned to the spot. I stared so long and hard into the creek that once I imagined I saw it, but it was only the rippling, sun dappled water itself. For the rest of the summer and the next, as I visited my frogs and crawfish and minnows, I continued to search and to this day I cannot walk along the stream without hoping for one more glimpse of the beautiful water snake. And there was my favorite of all, the salamanders. I loved the little critters. Two inches of wiggle under a rock. Plain brown was the most common coloring. Sometimes I'd find with an orange stripe. Yellow stripes were the rarest. I became so good at knowing where they lived that I seldom lifted a rock without finding one. But I loved them wrongly. I was satisfied with simply finding and watching them. I wanted to collect them, as if they were marbles or baseball cards. I remember walking through the park one day with two fistfuls of them and more in my pocket. Once I brought several home. 
I turn the black snake's brief abode, the picnic box, into a terrarium. Dirt, rocks, water. In went the salamanders. I forgot what I fed them. Whatever it was, they didn't eat. One day I found them dead, dried up like pieces of chewed rawhide. I buried them in the backyard, in the earth they never should have been taken from, and kept the lifeless picnic box terrarium as a reminder of a lesson learned. When I got my Christmas bicycle, I roamed far beyond the creek. The whole town was now within reach. I rode without destination, with no intent but to look and look and look. To find myself on one unfamiliar street was all the thrill I needed. I saw the rooftops of row houses stepping down the hills of the east end like stairways for giants. I coasted the broader avenues of the more affluent north end, amazed to see unattached homes with backyards and side yards and front yards. I saw the river banks of the Great Shulkill and learned to spell it. I saw the P&W high-speed trolley wobble across the river, tr river trestle from Bridgeport to nest at the terminal platform high above Swede Street. In the shadow of the P&W platform, I saw the green newsstand with every magazine in the world, or so I thought, and the line of radio taxis, black boxy little Plymouths, one of which was driven by my neighbor, Mr. Seaton. I saw the doomed courthouse, domed courthouse and the high stone walls of the country prison and the steep steeple of my church, First Presbyterian, said to be one of the tallest in the land, poking a hole in the sky. I saw the impossibly long, one block city hall where you could get yourself into or out of trouble at one end and buy penny candy at the other. I saw the sprawling red roof building of the Times Herald, Montgomery County's newspaper since 1799, I saw and smelled, again, the Adam Shank Brewery and the garlicky tang on East Main that came from Linfants and Lou's famous for the Zepp sandwich, salami, provolone, tomato, Bermuda onion, oil, with or without hot peppers, created in Norristown in 1938. I saw the bustling commercial district of Main Street and West Marshall, with movie theaters, four of them, and restaurants and shops of all sorts, and Chatlin's department store, home of the famous fluoroscope. When you needed new shoes, you went to Chatlin's with your mother. The salesman helped you try them on until you found a pair your mother liked. Then came the best part. The salesman stood up from his fitting stool and said, Well, why don't you have a look? And off we went, the three of you to the fluoroscope. It looked like something it looked something like the big floor cons console radio in your living room. Six inches up with a step leading to an opening into the interior of the scope. Since you knew the procedure, you didn't even wait for the salesman to say, Step up. You slid your feet into the opening, and then you had to fight in patience. First the salesman bent over and pressed his face to the goggle-shaped view. Wiggle your toes, he said. You wiggled your toes. He straightened up, nodding. Plenty of room. Then your mother looked. At last it was your turn. You bent down, scrunched your face to the viewer, and there they were, your feet, or rather the skeleton of your feet, your bones, your toe bones, wiggling in an eerie green glow. We'll take them, said your mother, and already you were eager to wear them out so you could come back to Chatlands and do this again. Other favorite stops were Blocks and Yosts. Blocks department store had the only Santa Claus I would talk to at Christmas time. For a long while, I was convinced that Blocks was home to the real Santa. And though I never bought anything at Yost's, a dry goods store in the corner of DeKalb and Maine, I stopped in occasionally because of a feature I'd never seen anywhere else. The selling floor had no cash registers. When someone made a purchase, the sales clerk took the customer's money and stuffed it into a small canister hanging above, hanging above her head. The canister was threaded onto a heavy string that swooped from the sales counter up through a portal on the second floor. Exactly how and why it all happened was a mystery to me. I only knew that the customer's money was soon zipping up to the second floor, and a minute later down came the canister like a chair on a ski lift, with change and receipt. Every counter had its own string to the second floor portal, so canisters were forever zipping back and forth just out of my reach, and all of this accomplished by tinkling bells. It was a show. My bike was more than wheels for aimless wandering. It helped me to answer many needs. Did I want to cool off? I coasted through the alley between Cone Streets and Hans Avenue and passed a Flavorite ice cream plant. Was I hungry? I pedaled to a mulberry tree. I knew everyone in town. My favorite was in Roger Edelman's backyard. I climbed it often and snacked off the branches, staining my fingers purple. Did I want a thrill? I rode out to the park zoo to the top of the monkey hill. I waited until the road was clear of cars and took off pedaling hard all the way down, down past the monkey cages. My record, according to my speedometer, was 45 miles per hour. Not bad for a single gear, flat, fat, tired roadmaster. Or another kind of thrill? Some days I might have, must have pedaled past Dovey Wilmot's house on Hawes Avenue ten times, hoping she, that the be beautiful platinum blonde would be on the front porch. If she was, I waved and called, Hi, Dovey, and kept circling the block. Every three minutes, Hi, Dovey, she always smiled and waved back. 
When I was 13, I was old enough to leave town. My roadmaster took me as far as Valley Forge National, National Historical Park, about five miles away. I crossed the Shulkill on the singing bridge, so called for the sounds of tires on steel great deck. You could see through the deck to the river below. For hours I rode the winding hills past cannon muzzles and monuments and replicated log cabins. Once I parked my bike and walked into a hillside meadow to lie back and get some sun. When I opened my eyes, hawks were circling overhead. Not trusting them to know I wasn't dead, I got out of there fast. Sometimes, if my planned route for the day took me across the tracks at the dead end, I had to wait for a freight train to pass. I never felt thwarted or impatient about this. In fact, the longer the train, the better. And if there were three or four engines, I knew it would be a very long one. By the end of junior high, the steam locomotives had given way to diesels. The diesels were neither as terrifying at night nor as exciting in daytime, nor did they leave me with a head full of coal grit. As the trains went by, I counted the cars. Box cars, tankers, flat cars, coal hoppers. By the time the caboose came clinking by, the engines were out of sight and earshot. Out beyond the park band shell, I loved the caboose. I was surprised that no one was ever standing at the back rail, coffee mug in hand, watching the world go by. In those days, I was many once, what's. A kid can be that. Grown-ups have, have gone ahead and answered the question, what shall I be? They have tossed out all the what's that don't fit and have become just one. Teacher, truck driver, business person. But a kid is still becoming, and I, as a kid alone, was free to be just about anything. So many careers came and went through me. Salamander finder, crawfish annoyer, flatstone creek skipper, cedar chest smeller, railroad car counter, tin can stomper, milkweed blower, mulberry picker, snowball smoother, paper bag popper, steel rail, rail walker, box turtle toucher, dark sky watcher, best part saver. They didn't last long, these careers of mine, but flashed into and out of existence like mayflies. But while they employed me, I gave them an honest minute's work and was paid in the satisfactions of curiosities met and a job well done. When I went roaming by myself on foot or bike, I discovered more than water spiders in foreign neighborhoods. I discovered myself. By myself, not boxed in by rules of play, I was free to think, to wonder, to swoon. That's what I did sometimes. I swooned, just thinking about things. Like time, like space. I tried to imagine, tried to grasp the speed of light. One hundred and 86,000 miles per second. And how about those stars up there? The ones I saw when the sky turned the color of my dungarees. I had heard that th these were the closest ones visible from Earth. I had heard there were billions and billions more too far away to see. And they went on and on and on until the end of the universe. I tried to imagine zooming past the last stars and looking around at what? What does the end of the universe look like? And what about time? What about before time? Thoughts like these did not come to mind as I flipped baseball cards with Spider Soloski, or played street football with Jerry Fox, or gumslingers with Johnny Seaton. They presented themselves behind closed eyes on hillside meadows, and during the long, lazy wait for a box turtle to cross the path. The questions were as elusive as the answers, as delicate as a dragonfly's wing. They gave me goosebumps. They made me dizzy. I swooned in my sneakers. That ends chapter 16. Please answer your questions before moving on to the next chapter.